So tonight I am super excited to do what we always do, fix our eyes upon Jesus, enjoy the sweetness of his presence, take the word and eat the word like bread fresh out of the oven, praise God, and let the Holy Spirit do something fresh in our lives. I always say this to you guys, but I'll say it again. I don't know if there's a better way to spend an hour than in the word of God and setting the heart upon Jesus. So that's what we will do. And like I always say to my, the regular AMI members, we're going to clear the deck. We'll push away all other things. And we're just going to quiet our hearts and center them directly upon the Lord and enjoy, just enjoy the sweetness of his presence given to you, <laughs> gifted to you, not because you earned it, not because you're worthy of it, but because Jesus Christ and his sacrifice is so perfect. He grants to you God's, uh, he grants to you his standing before God, praise God, which means you can enter in to enjoy him and live in that place of enjoyment. So Austin will play a little track. We'll just get quiet. Just get quiet. Put our hearts there. You know, for those of you that are new, let's just, uh, let me just help you uh, understand what we're doing when we do this. We set our hearts upon the Lord and we just get quiet and allow the reception to take place. There's an old illustration from Madame Guyon. She says, when the infant is upon the breast, it moves its lips to get the milk to start flowing. And once the milk begins to flow, the infant just stops and receives the milk. Just lingering, enjoying, receiving. It's a, it's a sustained consciousness of his presence. It's just aware of him and receiving him. But then if the, if the milk begins to wane, the infant moves its lips again to get the milk to start flowing. And then once the milk starts flowing, it just stops and receives the milk. So you're sustaining the sweet sense of his person. And that's all we're doing. Just lingering with him, lingering. And the Lord will begin to, as I like to say, adoration opens up that receptivity of the soul. Adoration is air and the kingdom of God. Adoration puts him where he's supposed to be and puts us where we're supposed to be. Adoration is that, that beautiful exchange as Evagrius Ponticus wrote many years ago. It is intercourse of spirit with God. And as Madame Guyon would say, the internal exercise of love, this, uh, this exchange, as Henry Skugel writes, he says, it is a state of the heart, the heart just set upon God. We're just going to sustain this. <laughs> I already feel such a sweetness of the Lord here. And then we'll get, get right into the scriptures. So Austin, why don't you roll a little six minute track? I'll mute myself and we will just enjoy the Lord just for six minutes or so to clear our hearts and set them. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. We worship you.
We praise you, Father, and we thank you for Jesus. He is so lovely to us. His character and his nature has won our hearts and continually wins our hearts. He wins our affection. We joyfully throw ourselves upon him and his great power. We joyfully throw ourselves upon him and his great mercy. <laughs> we joyfully receive of his fullness grace upon grace. Thank you that you are high priest. You are advocate. You are intercessor. We thank you for Jesus. He is everything to us. Let it be tonight, God, that we have fresh sights of divine things that cause us to be quickened and enlivened, literally breathe spiritual vitality into us, take weights off of our shoulders, stuff we've picked up, uh, dirt that we've collected just by being in this world and being in a body of sin. Lord, I pray that you would bring that yoke that is easy and that burden that is so light as we come to you and enjoy you. Lord, I pray for happiness, real happiness and joy to burst up from the inside and break depressions and, and these oppressions and the spinning of the mind. And Lord, I pray for this wonderful reality of peace that passes the ability to be understood. Real, real peace. Settle us in yourself. In your precious name, thank you. Amen. Amen. Again, welcome to any visitors. Hopefully you enjoy yourself tonight, feel edified and strengthened and want to become part of our precious community. We love being together and hearing from each other. And uh, these times together are very precious. Uh, I have prayed for tonight for a while now. And there were several ways I wanted to go. But there was a way I had to go because the Holy Spirit made it very clear. And then it became the only thing that mattered. <laughs> you notice how that happens sometimes? You have all these things you want to do, and then God tells you what He wants to do, and you let go of the things you want to do, and then all of a sudden you realize that's the only thing that's right. That's the only thing that's good. That's what I wanted anyways. I just didn't even know. <laughs> he has this way about Him that causes us to realize He's the only thing we ever really wanted in the first place. But we were just confused by flesh or pride or self-centeredness. But true happiness, deep-rooted joy of joys, is found in the will of God. Bunky used to say to me, the will of God is my home. The will of God is my home. I could actually say that the will of God is our joy. <laughs> Jesus said he delights to do God's will. His delight is right here. I feel like the biggest hindrance to people's happiness and delight in their lives is their own will. <laughs> it's just so strong and always present. This is why picking up the cross, which is the loss of self-consciousness, is the way to the highest joys that there are and the peace that is beyond the ability to be understood. So this is what I felt from the Lord, that tonight God would quicken me and quicken you by His grace to live more aware of the Holy Spirit. That's one. Two, to enjoy the Holy Spirit more in our lives. I feel like God wants to increase your enjoyment of the Holy Spirit. I feel like He wants to increase my enjoyment of the Holy Spirit. It, it already feels like the the fellowship that I have with the Spirit is the greatest joy of my life, but I feel like the Lord is saying there's so much more joy to be had. And I, and I extend to you that invitation from the Lord tonight to be more aware of the Holy Spirit and to go into another level of joy in the Spirit. Maybe there are precious wines of the Spirit that have yet to be broached. And may the Lord bring us into that tonight. And then uh, also to live more dependent upon his strength, his mind, his functions, to live more dependent upon him 
realizing his functions, his strength, his life, his mind, but also to live more from him towards others and the world. So recapping, th this is what I feel the Lord wants to do tonight. One, live more aware of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Ooh. Two, enjoy the Holy Spirit more. Three, to live more dependent upon the Spirit's strength and mind and functions. And four, that we would live from him towards others and the world. So our text tonight is John chapter 16, red words, words of Jesus, praise God. And this is what Jesus writes to us or says to us and is written by John. He says, I'm, I'm going to him who sent me and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Wow. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world of concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin, because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness, because I go to the father and you no longer see me and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, Jesus says, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that are the father that the father has are mine, Jesus says. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. We have read these words so many times that sometimes it just kind of gets filed into the cabinet of, yeah, that's what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. And I find I've fallen into that trap many times, but to take these words and say, okay, this is what that means. I believe that into the experience of that. That's rare. Some people can even quote this and don't have the faith into feeling of it or faith into the actuality of it. Yes, we put all our trust in the word of God, but real trust in the word of God always manifests in experience <laughs> because he is alive and he's alive forevermore. First thing I want to point out to, to you is this, the sorrow that he speaks of in verse six, this is a sorrow that you and I, we just have never known this sorrow because it's exclusive to those who have walked side by side with Jesus. He's speaking to those who know him after the flesh. They've left everything to follow him. They know him to be God. They've seen the miracles. They've seen his character, his integrity. They, they've, they've felt him. They've heard him. They've walked, they shared life with him. They've learned from him. And now he says, I'm leaving. <laughs> and imagine what that means for them in this place. What do they feel when the one that they know to be him is gonna go? They, they probably felt like salvation itself was leaving. They probably felt like hope is gone if he leaves. They probably felt like life itself is leaving. They probably felt like, where are we gonna find peace and joy if Jesus goes? You see, Jesus says, sorrow has filled their hearts. In other words, they feel it deeply. Their hearts are broken. They have spinning minds about what, what now do we do? What's gonna, the future going to hold? Maybe despondency. Maybe they're in the pool of despondency or, you know, that slush that um, John Bunyan speaks of in the Pilgrim's Progress. Maybe that's where they are in their minds. But <laughs> they thought also that he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. And now he's going to leave their expectations. Now their self erected expectations have now crumbled to the ground. So think of where they're at. Their expectations have crumbled to the ground. They don't know what the future 
hold the one that they love and adore and have been following for and left everything he's leaving they, they don't know what the they don't know what is going to happen to them now that Jesus is about to be uh you know he's going to leave so they're in this place and it is in that moment that sadness that gloom of mind and fearful future loss of all that's been held dear it's right there in the center of that lake of darkness that Jesus says these words it is to your advantage that I go <laughs> he says it's better that I go I mean their time with him his presence his guidance his voice him right in front of them and he says listen it's better that I that I leave you C can you imagine what you would feel in that moment you're staring at the eyes of God you know his 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 garment that he wears all the time you know how he responds to people you eat fish with him and you're staring in his eyes and he's everything to you. he's your whole world he's your messiah you're staring at him and he says it's better that that i go you're i mean if ever in my life i would have felt the urge to rebuttal the lord it probably would have been right there <laughs> i mean i don't think there's another statement said to the disciples that's that's harder to believe then God in the flesh looking at them saying, it's better that I leave. Uh, I mean, I think that they this would have shocked them if ever I would have had that, that feeling to say, Lord, it can't possibly be better. It, it can't, what's good without you? What matters if you're not here, my Lord? I mean, imagine that, that kind of brokenness in the heart, but there's something better than him standing in front of you that's hard very hard to believe this is the revelation that we need wherever you're at in your life jesus is teaching in the midst of sorrow in the midst of confusion in the midst of lost expectations in in the midst of the this tumult of life that is about to begin and is e even beginning Jesus then teaches the Holy Spirit. Jesus teaches on the Holy Spirit right in the center of the slum of sorrow. <laughs> Jesus teaches on the Holy Spirit right in the center of loss and disappointment and fear. Jesus says, okay, fear, disappointment, I have a, I have a word for you, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> to me, this is just, just like Jesus. It's almost as if he waits until there is absolutely no way to win the game and then he says holy spirit and that's everything that you need for life godliness for victory praise god so jesus enlightens them to what true spirituality is above their natural minds jesus is teaching above the natural mind the natural mind says it doesn't make any sense lord that this would be better but he's showing them what true spirituality is. He's, uh, he's pulling them away from dependency upon material Christ and pulling them into the realm of the eternal where there's an internal Christ. See, assimilating these things into our hearts will settle our hearts and bring us right where Jesus desires us to be in the midst of affliction, in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of loss, in the midst of pain. This understanding of the Holy Spirit is so important. <clears throat> Jesus in the flesh, this is what the difference is. Jesus in the flesh, and you guys know this, I'm reminding you of what you know, because I believe the Lord wants to call us into a greater awareness of the Holy Spirit, a, a deeper enjoyment of the Holy Spirit, to live more dependent upon the Holy Spirit, and to live more from Him towards others and towards the world. Jesus in the flesh is matter. He's material. He's, he's flesh and bone. And he can speak to them and he can speak to their minds and he can externally guide them. He can push their thoughts towards the ways of God. But in order to hear Jesus at this time, you have to be where he is. In, in order to uh, understand Jesus, you'd have to make sure you follow him and, and be around him. He's restricted. Jesus is restricted in a human body to uh, place and time. <clears throat> But um, 
Jesus is revealing to us something that is so much more, one, simple, so much more beneficial, and something so much more profitable than having to be with Jesus or being with Jesus in the flesh. Jesus will now be by the presence of the Spirit. Jesus will now be by the presence of the Spirit, the helper. Jesus will help them through the power of his Spirit. It's interesting that Paul calls the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He actually asked them to pray for the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ because it's he's the helper. Christ helping, aiding, strengthening through the Spirit. I, I've told the AMI group this before, but for you visitors, the word used by Jesus here, um, <clears throat> paraclete, it has to do with guide, advocate, strengthener, standby, or the present one. It's helper, intercessor, it's comforter, it's counselor, it's partner, it's teacher, it's leader. Jesus is saying, I'm now going to be able to be all of these things to you through the presence of my spirit. <laughs> he can speak the words into their minds in the flesh, but it's only external. But when he is by the spirit entering in, then he can make them that thing himself. See, he will establish within us these things that Jesus calls sin, righteousness, and judgment. Let me just talk about these for a second because this is really incredible. A person who has no uh, has no connection with God's ways in the Bible and has no experience of the spirit has not been born again. They're lacking to the core, three main things. One, the understanding of what sin is. And even if they do understand what sin is, they don't have the ability to feel it, feel its, its weight, feel its, its, uh, it, as, as who was it that wrote that famous quote, the exceeding sinfulness of sin. They can't feel it. The Holy Spirit brings that. They can't understand what righteousness is, nor would they ever be able to understand that righteousness could be imputed to a human. This is work of the Spirit. And they don't think without the conviction of the Spirit, there's no understanding of a coming judgment that the ruler of the world and this world itself is already doomed and is already decaying and will be replaced. The, he will change out the rulers of the heavens like a garment, the scripture says. He would change them out because they've become unclean. And then the Lord will bring everything back right where it is, and he will wipe every tear from our eyes himself. But these three things are the borders of what we know to be real life in Christianity. We understand sin. We've been convicted about it. We hate sin. And two, we understand now by the spirit conviction, we understand righteousness. And thirdly, we live framing our lives around the fact that this world is not it. <laughs> this world is simply <clears throat> not it. So he will establish within us these borders of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So important. The spirit will be Jesus's voice to them, inside them. Man, this is why it's better. Jesus says, you hear me with your physical ears, but soon I'll speak to you in your bones. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. He, on the inside, he will establish within us these borders, yes, but he will also be, the Spirit will be the voice of Jesus. He will not speak to them. The Holy Spirit will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, that he will speak. And notice that the Spirit and his influence in your life and in my life is connected to the words of Jesus Christ, the Word of God. There's an old commentator that writes this about that. He says, this, if the Spirit is separated from the Word of Christ, the door then is opened to all kinds of delusions. If the Spirit be separated from the words of Christ, Jesus says, no, no, he's not even going to speak on his own initiative. You don't even look to the Spirit to speak to you something contrary to Christ, because he won't. He can't, and he would never, but also he has one job. It's to deliver the words to you, to make the words alive to you. So he's saying, this commentator is saying, once somebody starts feeling like they got an impression that is contrary to the words of Jesus, the Word of God, that right then, 
no matter how spiritual it sounds and know how what kind of spiritual experience is connected to it, you've just opened the door to delusions. How can he say that? Because Jesus has tied together the Holy Spirit and his voice, the word of God. So the spirit indwelling them will enable them to understand what they are unable to understand by words alone. Jesus says, I, I have many things I want to speak to you but you can't bear them now. You don't have the capacity to receive the words that I wanna share with you. But when the spirit comes, then the spirit enables you to be able to receive these things. The natural man cannot receive these things, but by the spirit, we are enabled to receive the speakings from Christ that the apostles before the spirit being given were able to receive. Um, so I have much more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. But when he, the spirit of truth comes <clears throat> next, the spirit by the spirit, Jesus will continue to instructively walk with them. It's wonderful to think about that, that your sense of the spirit is not something independent from the bridegroom lover that you love. It is the communication of his presence, him. They are inseparable. Yes, three distinctly, in a sense, different, but yet one being. God is this triune being. And the spirit is inseparable from your experience of the person of Jesus. He actually is the application of. I just was reading John Flavel today, and he says, God has the heart to send his son the son has the heart to accomplish the work then the spirit has the heart to apply it <laughs> and th this this threefold cord cannot be broken and they work together for their purposes from the father accomplished by the son applied by the spirit praise god and so we see that jesus is teaching this by the spirit he will continually instructively walk with them within them so jesus is looking at them it's better that i go away why because i'm not going to walk next to you I'm going to walk inside you. Praise God. Praise God. I'm going to walk inside you as a personal, present leader. He will, the Bible says, Jesus says, guide you into all truth. Guides walk with you. He's going to not just in, instruct you by, by saying, hey, go over there and do this. He's going to walk with you and be by you in the presence of the Spirit to accomplish the thing. Uh, an early commentator writes this, the Holy Spirit is the perfect master of truth. <laughs> and why was he promised? But that they might deliver from hand to hand the wisdom which they received directly from him. Next, by the Spirit, Jesus will show them how things are to look in the future. So I was wondering what this meant, that the Spirit would show them about the future. I thought maybe it was like he was going to tell them, like prophecy or something like what's going to happen next. Uh, but this commentator brought up something I never thought of. Jesus has not yet died. And when he dies, he's going to rise again, obviously, and he's going to ascend and he's going to send the spirit. And when the spirit is sent, the spirit creates a family of God. It makes sons and daughters of God. We, we become born again and it creates what we know now to be the church, the called out ones, sanctified by the spirit, the reality of the family of God in the earth. That right there is something they had no grid for. You think about how they saw things and how they knew Jewish life to be. They did not have any clue what this was going to produce. And so what this commentator was saying is that the Holy Spirit is, was sent to create the church and in this, reveal to the apostles how this thing is supposed to play out. And therefore, we have, you know, letters written and we have the scriptures revealing to us this, what Jesus was going to create by his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and sending of the Spirit. Praise God. So, uh, Jesus will give to us himself by the Spirit. He will give us high sights of himself. The scripture says here, he will glorify me and he will take of mine and disclose it to you. An early commentator writes this, the spirit enriches us with nothing other than the riches of Christ. 
that he may display Christ's glory in all things. The spirit has in his mind one thing, the exaltation of, the making clear sight of Jesus Christ in all his resplendent glory. The Father has given all things into his hand and that he has accomplished all things and perfectly revealed the Father. The Spirit just wants to show you Jesus like this, exalting him, making our eyes clear to see who Jesus actually is. Um, so I wrote this down here because I felt like it was a good synopsis. He who is with you materially, Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm with you materially, I'm going to be with you immaterially. He's saying, I was with you in the temporary and seen, and I will soon be with you in the realm of the eternally unseen. He who spoke the ways of God to them by, by sound waves, he now empowers them to be these things. Do you remember Ezekiel 36, 26? The scripture says that he would give his spirit to us and cause us to walk in his ways. <laughs> this is the work of the spirit, not just to uh, have it written in front of you so you can read it with your eyes, but to write it on the inside of you and not just write it on the inside of you so that you can know it, but that by it being written on the inside of you, you follow its pattern by nature, a new nature following the carved heart, the word of God written on the heart. How wonderful is the Holy Spirit. You take the Holy Spirit out, this whole thing is impossible. I remember hearing, remember hearing Bill Johnson say one time, he said, people are shocked when somebody's raised from the dead, as if the rest of the Christian life was actually possible. <laughs> what a wonderful way to look at it. It is the exertion of God's wonderful, powerful spirit that enables your heart to no longer love sin, as it is the exertion of God's powerful spirit to raise somebody from the dead. Praise God. He works in us. I remember Ravenhill said, he said, the greatest miracle that I know is that God can take an unholy man out of the world, make him holy, stick him back in an unholy world and keep him holy. That's the Holy Spirit working and keeping us. Praise God. The Holy Spirit keeping us separate unto God. So he's lifting them out of the external, the natural, the seen, and he brings them into the unfading, the eternal, the, the factual, the true realm of the spirit. You see, understanding this, uh, understanding what this means for the disciples will discover for us uh, what personal comforts they were able to draw in that time of sadness and difficulty. So rewinding, Jesus, their Messiah, they've left everything to follow him. Their expectations are that he would rule. He says, I'm leaving. It means he's not going to rule right now. It means he's leaving. They don't know what they're going to do. They're in the place of sadness and heartbreak. And it's right there that he says, I'm sending you the spirit. And it is this that shows us their hearts were able to find comfort by these words from Christ. And then ultimately, they found this comfort experientially when the Holy Spirit fell. Now, there's a verse, there's a chapter in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You guys have probably all read it many times, but Paul uses the same exact word that Jesus uses here for the helper, the paraclete. He, he uses the same word for comfort in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, talking about when affliction comes and pressure hits you, people betray you, problems happen. When all this pressure comes, it, Paul says the comfort comes equally and even more so the abundance of paraclete comfort the comfort of the holy spirit in exact proportion to trial and even greater greater than the proportion to trial and then he says so that we can comfort others so it's this is the picture that i get pressure comes to me god gives me more than i need to be able to go through that and the more that i need that overflows me goes to other people can help other people this is the work of the spirit and the human life everything that's needed right there and so do you have trials in your life probably do <laughs> you probably do jesus told us that we in this world we will have tribulation but then he says take heart you know i've over overcome the world 
But do you have trials? Do you have temptations? Do you have sorrows? There's a word for you. Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go away because I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. Praise God. <laughs> do you have um, expectations? Have you have, do you have self-erected expectations that have been let down and your heart is, is discouraged by that? There's a word for you. It's from Jesus. And he says, it's better that I'm not there because I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'm going to enter into you. Praise God. Do you, have you felt loss or, or some special comfort lost? Or have you had a lack of life or vitality or strength in your life? Are you lacking peace and joy? Do you feel like your heart is broken? There's a word for you. And it is this. I don't want to be there externally. I want to be there internally. Jesus is saying, I don't want to speak my words to you in your human ears and your external ears. I want to speak my words to your bones. Jesus is saying, I don't want, I don't want to walk by your side through this. I want to walk in you and get you through. I want to pick you up and carry you by the presence of my spirit. Praise God. The Holy Ghost is amazing. Is your mind spinning with a million things? Do you feel despondent? Here's the word of the Lord to you today. I have come to walk in you. I've come to speak directly into you. I have come to be all that you need for life and godliness in everything that you go through. So Jesus I want to give myself more fully to you. I feel like this is what the Lord is saying through this whole uh, 11 verses. I want to give myself more fully to you than physical nearness. I want to give myself to you more fully than touch or sound or human wisdoms. I want to give myself to you by way of indwelling. I want to cause you to walk in my ways. I want to be comfort. I don't just want to comfort you. I want to be your comfort. I want to be your joy. I want to be your satisfaction, your strength, your life, your peace. I want to be wisdom on the inside of you for he is unto us wisdom. And the spirit of God is the spirit of wisdom. You say, Eric, it feels like you're, you're trying to really nail home the Holy Spirit. Yes. I feel like God has spoken to me for you. And I feel like this is what he's saying to be, he's inviting us all, myself included, into a a deeper awareness of the Holy Ghost and a greater enjoyment of the Holy Spirit, a, a deeper dependence upon his powers, his abilities, his mind, praise God, and that we would go forth from and to the world in him. So Jesus saying, I tell you the truth. Every time he says this, it has something to do with something that's going to be hard to believe. But Jesus says, I want you to know this is the truth, what I'm going to tell you. Hard for you to understand? Yes, because I can't think of anything better than the God man standing right in front of me. But I need the Bible to reprogram my mind to realize him giving me his Holy Spirit on the inside is better than having Jesus standing in the flesh next to me. Still very difficult to understand and to believe. But Jesus says, I, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. The Amplified Bible reads it like this. I am telling you nothing but the truth when I say that it is profitable, it is good, expedient, advantageous for you that I leave. Because if I don't go away, the comforter, the counselor, the helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, present one will not come into close fellowship with you. But if I go, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. I almost feel like David's prophetic song in Psalm 94 verse 19 finds its fulfillment right here in the Holy Spirit. He says, when, when my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your consolations, comfort that comes from a person, your consolations delight my soul. <laughs> Is there a greater fulfillment to that verse than the comforter being sent from heaven to live and dwell inside of you in the midst of all the stuff that is coming against you in this life. Uh, early commentator writes this, far more desirable is that presence of Christ by which he communicates himself to us through the grace and power of his spirit than if he were present before our eyes. To me, I look at it and I, I, I feel like pain is inevitable. Yes, so he sends the comfort of the spirit. That, that my need for him is inevitable. So he sends the Holy Spirit. Men do not, even believers themselves, do not feel the gravity of sin and unbelief. They don't feel the, the defiance that it is to God or the provocation it is to God. 
when we don't believe him. But the spirit brings that into us where we can feel the vibration of that severity. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to say, you know, I know that's wrong, but when you feel it being wrong and it feels like you're wasting away, the longer you entertain that thing, that's the work of the spirit. You know, I love prophecy. I'm all for prophecy. <clears throat> I'm all for visions and dreams. I love all that stuff. But I feel like the, Jesus is trying to tell us, this is how you can see the work of the spirit in your life. When you tremble at sin. When the thought of sin is, is rebutted by the conviction and convincing that it is defying God. I'm not saying that we're perfect or that we live, you know, com you know, completely sin free. That's not what I'm saying. But there should be a deep sense of conviction concerning sin. And it's also that when we preach the gospel, the spirit does that work and convinces people of their unrighteousness so that they can cry out for Christ. Just like I read from Flavel today, who looks for a Band-Aid who hasn't been injured? You know, when you've been injured, then you look for balm. And so it is. He first convicts of sin before he convicts of righteousness because you got to see your need before you can see what's supplied, which is that righteousness. And so we see here that <clears throat> the Holy Spirit does this incredible work of showing us what sin is. He also convicts us thoroughly of righteousness. This is something that I feel like we forget we need. We need, as Christians, a continual refresh on the recognition of righteousness. Not just being able to say, I stand righteous before God because that's what the Bible says, but I stand righteous before God because that's what the Bible says and I believe it and I feel that. That reality is being worked in me and it causes praise to erupt in my heart when I can say things like this, I stand before God as Christ because Christ stood before God as me. The Spirit does that. The Spirit takes it from a theological understanding and makes it an inward conviction, praise God, not just of sin, but also of righteousness, so that you have full boldness to approach God and lay your heart out before Him and pour out your heart before Him, for God is a refuge for us. We can dive right in to the throne because we have perfect righteousness given to us through Jesus Christ. The Spirit makes this real. You see, if the Spirit is not doing this work in our lives, we won't approach God because we will be living under condemnation. Condemnation is a lack of the work of the Spirit in this area, righteousness. And sin, living, uh, what do you call it, living in habitual sin is a lack of the work of the Spirit concerning the conviction of sin. So the Spirit will pull you this way away from sin and He will convince you thoroughly of righteousness to take you up. So He pulls you away from the world and up to God, this is the beauty of sanctification, away from sin, up into righteousness before God. With this, um, with this framework, judgment is coming. The ruler of the world stands condemned. Men feel unable to feel the world to come. Men, by default, don't think of the certainty of the doom of this world. We often don't look for the adversary's judgment. We don't think about it often, but the Holy Spirit begins to put this on the inside of us and realize that the devil and all those who want to follow him will be judged. And this is part of the work of the Spirit to make this a conviction on the inside of us that governs, helps us govern our lives and preach the gospel correctly and with fervor. So because we cannot hear Christ in the heavens while we're on the earth, we need the Spirit to breathe his impressions into our hearts. And that's the wonder of the Spirit. How many of you have had that even recently? Maybe today you were uh, praying, or worshiping, or reading the scriptures, and you had an impression of something that God was saying to you. Praise God. That's so precious. The Spirit is making Jesus heard. And that changes your heart, changes your life. It shifts, it shifts everything. And it's, it's a love relationship. It is the highest thing that can happen to you in this world that His voice by the Spirit can be impressed upon you. Remember Charles Finney wrote, cherish the slightest impressions from the Holy Spirit. And maybe that's part of God inviting us into a deeper awareness 
of the Holy Spirit, maybe the, the Lord is going to increase each one of our cherishing of the Holy Spirit. You know, um, maybe you'll be praying and all of a sudden you just become aware of the Holy Spirit. And instead of just saying, I'm aware of the Holy Spirit and continuing on, maybe it's going to move us to a place where we just stop. And we begin to say things like, oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presence. Oh, how I need your presence, Lord. Oh, how I live for the sweetness of your presence, Lord. A deeper awareness, cherishing the slightest impressions of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Um, so because also they have no idea what Jesus is producing through his redemption, he sends the Spirit to reveal to them the family of God. But because we cannot rightly exalt Christ in our lives, we don't have the ability to keep Christ in that high place without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit keeps Christ in his proper exalted state. When we remove Christ from the, that exalted state, it is evidence of a lack of awareness of and lack of yielding to the Holy Spirit. A person stays revived, lives in revival to the degree that they yield to the Holy Spirit who puts Christ in this high place. Vance Havner said, uh, revival is simply people falling in love with Jesus all over again. Uh, one guy said it like this, revival is lordship of Jesus Christ. It's just coming underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ, letting him reign in your life because the kingdom of heaven is not a matter of talk, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Praise God. This exaltation of Jesus, keeping him up here, is the work of the Spirit. And as we yield to him, we live in that revived state. Praise God. Um, so also, because men cannot obtain the things of the Father, the Holy Spirit is sent to give us Christ. Praise God. You know, Kathy Walters once said, the Holy Spirit was sent to get it all out of the book and into my life. I think that's a great way to look at that. And the more we give attention and yield to the Holy Spirit, the more the realities of the scriptures and the things described in the word will become our reality. I read today, I, I was reading a couple things today, Sibs and also Flavel. And one of the guys, I can't remember which one it was, <clears throat> but he, he was saying that comforts are neglected by a lot of Christians because they won't simply come to the Lord. They lack the comforts that happen in coming to the Lord. And so he was going on this long tangent about how negligent or negligence, neglecting the person of the Lord causes all kinds of things that people look for remedies for and all kinds of other things. But in coming to the Lord and enjoying the Holy Spirit, yielding to the Holy Spirit, all those things in the book, get out of the book and into the life. So I wrote this down as a, uh, as a synopsis. And it's kind of like my prayer. This is what I was praying for every AMI member and even for the guests that would join tonight. That uh, we're not told of the Holy Spirit so that we would know that what the apostles, merely know what the apostles received after the Lord ascended. It's not just that. Nor are we told of the Spirit so that we can merely know that that's God's design, that we would have the Holy Spirit. It, it's part of it. But we're told of Him that we might hear these words tonight about the Holy Spirit and what he is and what he does, and that we would believe these words. And then by faith, know by experience, the helper in our lives, in our trials, in our sorrows, feel the sinfulness of sin and unbelief, know what righteousness is and the joy of its imputation, frame our lives around the fact that there's a coming judgment, receive revelation beyond the intellect from the indwelling of the Spirit, convicting us of what the truth is, be guided by His presence into all truth, experientially hear the voice of Jesus in the Word of God, have Christ Himself disclosed in our hearts, receiving of Him by the work of the Spirit and union with God the Father. 
I pulled this from John Flavel. He's talking about when the Holy Spirit comes. Oh my gosh. I was reading this today and I was so happy reading what he was saying. I could have erupted into praise. I kept my cool because I wanted to continue reading, but I could have just jumped up and down. Maybe I should have, but listen to this. He's speaking of when you have received the Holy Spirit <laughs> and this life that you have, listen, you have this life from the Holy Spirit and he's describing it. He says, then do we begin to live when we begin to have union with Christ, the fountain of life by his spirit communicated to us. He says, the spirit being divine, it must, this new life being divine, it must needs be the most excellent and transcendent life that any creature doth or can live in this world. It surmounts the natural, rational, and moral life of the unsanctified as much as the angelic life excels the life of flies and the worms of the earth. <laughs> so you got an angel, you have an angel shining with glory and a worm making his way across the He's saying that's the difference between your old life and a life filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. The next thing he says here, he says, uh, this life infused by the regenerating spirit is a most pleasant life. All delights, all pleasures, all joys, which are not delusive, have their spring and their origin in him. Praise God. To be spiritually minded is life and peace, most serene placid life, such a soul becomes so far as it is influenced and sanctified by the spirit, the very region of life and peace. He said, you never had a cheerful day till you begin to live unto God. <laughs> he says here, none can make another by any amount of words to understand that pleasure, which is in the renewed soul diffused through all its faculties and affections in its communion with the Lord and in the sealings and witnessing of the Holy Spirit. We have in the Holy Spirit, heaven on the earth. He's called the foretaste of glory divine by Fanny Crosby taken from Paul saying he is the down payment of the world to come. He said, Eric, what is the point tonight? The point is that God is inviting me and you us into a greater awareness of the Holy Spirit who is with you and in you and in, into a greater enjoyment of his presence, enjoyment of these things that he is. He's calling us into a deeper dependence upon his power and his strength. And then he wants us to go forth from him to the world. I pulled an old hymn. This, I, I was reading these in preparation they're from an old Methodist hymn book. As I was reading them, my heart started to burn within me. I could feel it physically as I read these, these hymns. They're, they're real short, but I wanted to share them with you because I, I thought they were just outstanding. May the Lord move on you as I read these to you. Come, Holy Ghost, our hearts inspire. Let us thine influence, influence prove source of old prophetic fire, fountain of life and love. Come. Holy Ghost, for moved by thee, the prophets wrote and spoke, unlock the truth, thyself the key, unseal the sacred book, praise God. Expand thy wings, celestial dove, brood over our nature's night, on our disordered spirits, move and let there now be light. God, through the spirit we shall know, if thou within us shine and sound with all the saints below, the depths of love divine, praise God. That was Charles Wesley. This one is from Paul Gerhardt. Holy Ghost, dispose and dispel our sadness. Dispel our sad. Holy Ghost, dispel. I pray the Holy Spirit, dispel your sadness. If you felt corners of your heart becoming droopy with sadness, I pray the Holy Spirit right now, tonight, dispel that sadness. Pierce the clouds of nature's night. Come, thou source of joy and gladness. Breathe thy life and spread thy light. For the height which knows no measure, as a gracious shower descend, bringing down this richest treasure man can wish and God can send. The Holy Spirit. Praise God. Here's another one. This is Edwin Hatch. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew. 
that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine, till all this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. Praise God. One last one. And this next one is so powerful. I pray, just even as I read this, just close your eyes, put your hand on your heart. I'm going to read this over you. Let this be a reality to you today. Put your hand on your heart. Yeah, close your eyes. Listen to this. Come, Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, with all thy quickening powers, kindle a flame of sacred love on these cold hearts of ours. Oh, raise our thoughts from things below, from vanities and toys. Then shall we with fresh courage go to reach eternal joys. Awake our souls to joyful songs. Let pure devotion rise till praise employs our thankful tongues and doubt forever dies. Come, Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, with all thy quickening powers. Come, shed abroad a Savior's love, and that will kindle ours. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. For me, for every viewer, by the work of Christ, I'm asking that you would give us grace to be more attentive to, cherish more the presence of the Spirit. And Lord, not just cherish the presence of the Spirit, but enjoy it. Enjoy Him, for He is our contact with, our sight of, our hearing our experience of you, precious Jesus. I pray that all of us from this day forward will enter into a new level of dependency upon the Spirit's power, the Spirit's working in the mind, in the heart, in the desires, His functions. And Lord, lastly, let us be a people who go forth to others and to the world from this consciousness of your presence, this power in your presence, this reality of godliness through the Spirit of God in us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, sorry, I, I went a little long. Um, I, I really feel like uh, something happened to me tonight. And my heart feels so soft. I pray the Lord just do the same. Even tomorrow, as you wake up in the morning and you go be with the Lord, I pray your heart be so soft and tender towards Him. Yeah, and full of courage and strength to do the things God's called you to do. May grace work in you, praise God. Not only to say no to ungodliness, but also to work in you, both to will and to do for His good pleasure. In Jesus' name. I love all you AMI uh, members. You guys are the best in the world. Praying for you every day. If you're a, a, a visitor tonight, Austin's going to stay on. If you have any questions about uh, being part of our community that meets every Tuesday night, we've had many wonderful guests this year and we'll have many uh, for the rest of the year. So love you all.